good evening and good evening, uh, President. Um, can I ask you first, what's your first memory of speaking uh, at, at Brussels? You see that the military have their uses. <laughs> no, it, the 1960s, I, I was auditor of the, the Literary Debating Society in, in Galway, University College Galway, UC, UCG as we called it then. Uh, and but I had been debating. I, I, I went to the university in 1962, and I think I was in teams coming to around the place uh, all of the years, and in 64, and 63, 64, and 65. It, 1963 was a particularly interesting year because Garrod was my partner, Garrod O'Toohig was my partner. Another time would have been Sean O'Higgin. And then, uh, but Gareth and I uh, then went on to debate. Uh, we went to Birmingham and we went to Goldsmiths. We were um, in that year participating in debates. You had Eamon McCann and Michael Farr representing Queens. I know it in the film, Melissa Stanford and Hilary Reynolds. And here you had David McConnell and Keanu Hagerty. And I think. Uh, we did well, Gareth and myself, in Birmingham. I remember it very, very clearly. And then in Goldsmiths, we were defeated uh, by uh, David McConnell and Keanu Hagerty in what is widely regarded as an unfair decision. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a, a poem on the hist uh, by Michal O'Shiel in the forthcoming oh, yes. book by Patrick Gagan. And it's about um, the young debater. Uh, and I want to quote just a few lines of it. The young debate, debater, full of green and youthful self-esteem. I'm sure yourself and Garoj were, were, were that at the time. And he writes of the debater, learning ploys and tricks, play, them to the play then to the house, out wit with guile, driving home an argument that sticks, score your point to swing the rank and file. Now, were you aware of, of just the technique of debating and bringing forward that the power of being, having the, the audience, as it were, there for you to persuade. Oh, yes, but I think I always saw it as performance. Uh, uh, I, I think that you, you couldn't wait to, to win the argument. At that time, it was very much binary. You, you were, whichever side you were on, one of the techniques was to, of course, take your opponent's arguments and run them on to a point of absurdity and then make your way back and so on. And which I often think it changed then in later times where people would be speaking to the motion. But I remember very well when the debates I in my time as auditor, uh, there were never less than 300 people in, in the Greek Hall in UCG. And it was performance from the word go. That's in the chair now because you were dealing with hecklers as well who were quite as important as those who were speaking at each side of a motion. But in relation to the preparation of argument, it was something that I think was very, very important. If you think of the people I mentioned that, that we, we were competing. For example, I think it's Patrick Egan's book will show that Eamon McCann, I think, won the individual speaker for a speech against socialism. <laughs> uh, but it will show you uh, about, in fact, actually how you had, in fact, to be able to use categories of argument. But they had to be informed. 
And I, I think that that was very, very important. Remember, the, most of the debating societies usually have the word literary or history associated with them. So the assumption is, is that you are actually taking uh, what you might, what you may choose different sources of authority for opinion, as you know yourself as a historian. But the point is, it, you, you would be as dead as a doornail you, you, if you just sat there uh, appearing clever. Uh, the issue was indeed to move people. And uh, some of us have been at that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, where, but I can... You'll I can always not... know, by the way, they you say very interestingly about, in, you, uh, you know that phrase that's used about uh, Larkin and Connolly is that Larkin would get them uh, to gather and to listen, but Connolly would get them to stay. And they're very different uh, approaches in relation to the presentation of argument. But you mentioned Eamon McCann speaking against socialism. Did you find yourself, and I can imagine you uh, sort of as a persuasive debater on an argument where you favored what you were saying, but I find it more difficult to understand that you would say if the motion was that the West is, is asleep and it should stay in its slumber because it's no good anyway, I can't see you enjoying that or performing Oh, no, well. this is, that's the whole nature of the performative. You, you must be able uh, to go into the agonist of the, the agony of the alternative. It isn't only, people use that awful cliche about putting yourself in the shoes of the other. Somebody remarked to me about people would steal the shoes of the other, but the, the fact is you must be able to travel uh, to, uh, along the spectrum of, of others' opinion. I actually have, I see that now in relation to where I am now as very, very important on the import, this is where debating is important, on the importance of the discursive. And I, I, act, I think in relation to uh, defining democracy, for example, if you say that Republican democracy is different than a democracy that is predicated on the pursuit of interests, so it presumes that you, in fact, actually are able to be in an axis of communication with the other, because it is through the common bond, if you like, that the principles of legitimacy are established. So therefore, there is a huge importance to being able to put yourself in the argument of the other and to put yourself in the mind of the other. Then there is another side, which I've later, of course, but I've been dealing with issues of memory and whatever. You may need to be able to park opinions because there's no such thing as, uh, uh, as a received certainty in anything that one is recalling because it must always be open to revision. And if it is open to revision, then to achieve revision, you have to be able to listen to the alternative. And what was your impression of that generation of debaters, that first generation that you competed against? Because you haven't mentioned the LNH, they were extremely strong in UCD at the oh, time. Oh, yeah. Tony Clare. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Tony Clare and, and Paddy Cosgrave. Paddy Cosgrave, yeah. Paddy Cosgrave was uh, having his Bracken period. Uh, he, he went, walked, he had. He, he used a walking stick, I think, at that stage, at one stage, you know, as a kind of further prop. Anthony Clare was a magnificent speaker, and Anthony Clare became a good friend of mine much later on, because we were both interested in, in his work on social psychiatry and that. But he, no, they were very, very, that was very good. They, and it was a very, very different venue. Um, <laughs> I remember... Uh, uh, Coming to Trinity was interested me. I, I think I, I hope people were under people from my, like myself and Garrett and others. There were two draper shops in Galway who used to hire out dress suits, and I think I have said getting your dress suit was one of the complex things that one had to do. And I said particularly when you bore in mind that you were meeting people who gave the impression that they dressed for dinner every night. But they, <laughs> but I, I think. We had a, we, I actually liked one thing. Why did I stay for so long when I was speaking in Kyber's paper? I think that there was 
a pursuit of the exoticism that I associated with Trinity College. Uh, that I had an assumption, I think, that people lived a bohemian existence uh, and that it was something that I shouldn't miss. Rather like, you know, that, as I said somewhere else, you shouldn't die wondering anywhere. But the, uh, so there was that in it. But then you went to the LNH, and the LNH was indeed very different. It was a huge bear uh, pit. But then we went to, I remember in some of the, the universities in England, you'd be in some rooms that were really a kind of a cross between a funeral parlor and a seminar room. And it was very difficult to get yourself going in, uh, yeah. in, 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 in such an so atmosphere. So did you need... Did, what the bigger you, what the audience, the better. Yeah. Yeah. What got you going? Yeah. I say, I'm asking you, what got you going? What did you need? Did the Hector... What, what? No, I, I think you know. Uh, this is what they used to say in the old uh, acting days. And both Gareth and I had been in drama societies as well. And they would say to you, you must pitch... And you know when you're wasting your time and when you're... But it's, that's what you're there for. But that's, uh, there's a moral issue there as well, is that if you take an argument, you have a responsibility to present it and to launch it and to get a resonance from it and so, and so on. Now, you would, if those who would be going on for a career in law uh, at a certain stage of their career would think that it was all theatre and... <laughs> A certain amount of jurisprudence, but they'd be reminded very quickly that you'd better get back on the furrow. You know, yeah. uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Davis, as auditor of the HIST, uh, wrote a, it was part of his uh, auditorial address, the utility of debating societies in remedying the defects of a university education. Um, and this was a thinly disguised attack on Trinity College and its narrow curriculum. Um, on the shore of democracy was a monstrous danger, a moral darkness ready to rebarbarize the earth. Now, these are some of the ideas that you have come forward with recently, really in some of, some of your own writing and, and lectures on the function of the university and, the, and what needs to Well, first of all, uh, in relation to the actual speaking itself and moving off the de uh, debating as a practice, uh, it's a life-changing experience. Pe most people who have done it will remember the very first time that they debated and the sensation that it was. But yes, I have. And um, <laughs> I, I, I've written rather seriously about uh, what the, where I see the universities. I spoke to the Conference of European Universities and... Um, I, I got quite a correspondence, mostly favorable, but I feel that the critical capacity of the university is, is very important. The breadth of the teaching is, is very important. And I, I feel you use the, a, a, a very dangerous word there, the word utilitarian. Uh, the universities are not there merely to produce citizens who are useful. There to be people to produce citizens who respect the rights of others to participate and also to be able to participate fully, drawing in a wide range of scholarship. I have been very critical of, of uh, the teaching of some subjects because I think they have become narrow. I also feel that it's just something I, I was looking at today, a new book by uh, Wendy Brown on In the Ruins of Neoliberalism. And it is about how, if you like, uh, we, we criticize very much versions of the marketplace and its dominating influence. But it isn't only in the realm of the traded economy. It says that it has saturated the thinking and it made its way into the institutions. So that this breadth I speak of, this critical capacity, the idea that it is in the end about how to live and how to live and experience and fulfill the self through others. That is something that is a real, pro is a real issue in the universities. There, obviously, there are constraints in relation to funding and whatever, but I think there is too much pressure uh, uh, as well. I, one of the, 
I would there are lists in some of the papers I've written. I've written about many people's Marcuse, for example, so an awful lot of if you like. There is uh, <laughs> the great pessimism of Adorno, uh, and which really saw Chetnos defeating uh, original thinking. I think that that has happened in many, many ways with a very extraordinary result. You have people who are alienated, you have people who feel useless, you have people <coughs> me, and people who feel that they have lost an attachment uh, to society and decision-making, the delegitimating process. And they become available then uh, for others who will come and say to them, I want to be your voice. Uh, I want, this is the background to make America great again and uh, that nonsense and so on. It is just a wild shout, but it is exploitative of an alienation group. And you can see it in its different phases. You first get people who feel they've been left behind. Then you get its second phase after the 2008, where you start looking for scapegoats and you say, it's all the cause of them. It's all the fault of the migrants. It's all the fault of so on, people who look different. But the universities we so rely on in many, many cases to create that moral space where people will be able to evaluate and judge different suggestions and so on. And uh, no, I'm not... Uh, and do you think that's been eroded? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up, I do. And I think that... Uh, 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 as well, there's a myth involved in it then. In many cases, it's the business of being aware. Uh, I, 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 I very much, very much, uh, 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 very much support an analysis of uh, new writing like that as a Professor Hartmut Rosa from Leipzig and Jena University who, who writes about resonance. How do you approach the world? Do you approach the world with fear or with wonder? Or do you feel that you're dissociated, that your connection with the world is broken? I think we have a fractured society and that the university is the place to where you would go, if you like, for putting things back together in relation to discursive options. It doesn't matter, but as long as it is able to be stated, be part of a discursive exchange, we lost many, many opportunities. I think that it is that uh, in many cases I saw there was a kind of an inferiority complex among some very serious academics. I think that they, had a, they believed a kind of a, myth, a bit of a myth that there was magic happening in the marketplace and that maybe we could bring some of that magic back into what we... When in fact actually what you had was a whole series of vulgar chancers very often operating in the marketplace. Uh, so that you, that, that, that's the straight answer to your question. I could go on about it. What do I think about it generally more easily? Where is it now going? When I was finishing teaching, I had to, to, took up my stand in relation to what you might call ph phenomenological uh, sociology. That's where my work was. And I, I, I find that very interesting because the, the society that many, many people, one of the things you can do, well, if you're responding to what I have just described, you think that you're going to be very original by a form of excess. But that actually is you're only just another form of servitude. There is, that's why the intellectual work is very important, but so also is what I call the music of the heart and the music of the senses, the five senses. You know, in that paper, one of my papers that I spoke to, I spoke, I think, in Athens on, on uh, the distinction between uh, Aristotle, for example, privileged the sense of touch, and Plato privileged the visual. And the curious side is that Western thinking sided the Platonists won but I think that they won at a great cost in relation to the neglect of the body and in relation to a whole series of, if you like, exciting work in relation to uh, the contribution of the sensory to our understanding. But I could go on all day on this now, so it was, you must ask me another question. Can, can I ask you? But touch is the one that is important, remember. 
I'm with Aristotle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I recall, I recall um, your inauguration address as president. Uh, I was doing the television commentary, and there was a shot came into the frame of the then American uh, ambassador, Dan Rooney, uh, making, making some notes. And I, was, I just wondered, because uh, I made the point that you had spent more time outside the American embassy uh, protesting <laughs> against <laughs> visitors than you had ever spent inside the American embassy. And you know, and you did you did refuse to be in the doll when Ronald Reagan and you you also yes. absented yourself in NUIG um, when he was given an honorary degree. Well, I'm probably yeah. responsible for their pushing up the railings. I, I it, it, it was back at, in I think 19... at Pembroke Road at Elgin Road, yeah, in the yes. American Embassy. Yeah. When when I was there first, you could go right in up the steps and yes. so on, and we had uh, 24 hour and 48 hour fasts around the time of the illegal selling of arms through Honduras to Salvador. That was, which enables me to say as well, just one of the things that on Sunday, I issued a statement this afternoon expressing my sadness at uh, the passing of Ernesto Cardenal, that wonderful mystic poet, liberation theologian, and I also was the culture minister in, uh, in Nicaragua when I was there. But you're quite right. It wasn't uh, what was at stake that time, and uh, was information and knowledge about what was taking place. You, I re remember about Salvador, which I mentioned, my dear friend who died last year in an accident in, in, in Guatemala, Sally O'Neill Sanchez, and I wrote about the massacre in Mohote. And we were called liars for 10 years. And then it was proved, and now the forensic anthropology is laying out the bodies side by side. And of course, the Inter-American Court and the court in Costa Rica agreed that uh, it was genocide and it was acknowledged and by, by the government of Salvador. Was that I don't, I think it was, I think that we cre helped create a, an inf a knowledge about illegal uh, sales of armaments and others. Again, I used to cry Mr. Rooney was that he, he might have been, uh, at one stage they sent auto, they sent it, uh, an ambassador over to boost the ambassador here to take part in debates with uh, people from Trocra and myself and so on when we had come back. I should tell you there's a happy ending to, the, to it only in part, and that is that in 82, I think I was asked to leave El Salvador, and you could say this somewhat unpleasantly with people waving guns and that. But then uh, I went back as president and I was given the keys of Salvador City, and I was given a, 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 not an honor by the parliament, and it was read out indeed by the, uh, the son of the person who I think was responsible for most of the killings. But I, ha I, I think there were great years. Uh, I was so pleased that I, I miss uh, people. I pay great tribute to Otrokra and Sally O'Neill and all the different places that, that were. Well, yes, you're right. I was outside the American embassy then in more. And I think then you, another great debater, Eamon McCann, and you mentioned the, the Reagan visit. Eamon McCann and I uh, were, there were four different organizations protesting against that visit. But Eamon McCann and I were, in fact, the regular speakers at all four organizations. <laughs> so, our skills were used well. <laughs> <laughs> and was all very civilized, yeah. 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 Um, we forget very easily. Um, but there was it's... nothing personal in yeah. it. It was yeah. an argument about foreign policy. Yeah. Because he was quite a charming man himself. And uh, there was something very hope folks and nice about those films and the rest of it. But it was undrawing the distinction between film and politics that was, I think, difficult for him. Yeah. We've, we've, spoken, we've spoken, President, about the 1960s when you were debating uh, 
here in, in, this, uh, yes. in this university and elsewhere. But, you know, the 50s in Ireland were really, uh, just looking at Patrick Aiken's book and indeed with David McConnell's introduction. Yeah. And there are two episodes there which are, which are so informative. The Hist in 1957 had a, had a motion that this house disapproves of birth control. Of birth control. Yeah. Disapproves of birth control. And this had to be held in camera, instructed by the board of Trinity College. It could not be discussed in public by the Hist. Um, and in 1958, uh, the Hist decided that they would have a debate that this house approves of divorce. And then very mischievously, uh, the secretary, on the instructions of the auditor, invited John Charles McQuaid to participate and to speak at this particular debate. McQuaid was not amused, as you can imagine. But what he did was he contacted the provost, McConnell, and the hist officers were carpeted by the board, and the debate never happened. Now, that tells you an enormous amount about the 1950s in Ireland, and about Trinity, and about the hist. Um, and it really, it, it, it was quite, a, of course, it also tells you a lot about McQuaid. McQuaid loved outcomes where his fingerprints, where his outcome was the one he wanted, but where his own fingerprints were not on the policy detail. Um, he was expert at that. But it, it, it shows the, the wicket, if I can use the cricketing metaphor then, that you, your generation, just a, a, a six, eight years later, six, seven, eight years, were batting on and were opening up this world. But, but Ireland in the 50s was very sheltered. Yes, well, the atmosphere anyway, between 1955 and 60, uh, a, a quarter of a million people emigrated to England. About The average figure every year is between 46 and, and 48,000. And uh, people, the country was, was, the atmosphere was, was, as well as that, the discussion on immigration in relation to the religious people you mentioned many cases was about going to, there was a, a great debate going on actually as to whether they should try to stop immigration or whether in fact they should encourage it. But part of the, the debate also was about them going to godless England and uh, so on. Well, I do think there were other things. Something that is, I think, important is that in the 60s, there was a, a set of new cultural influences. Uh, it's the time of Brecht and so on. The, 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 the cultural influences were, again, reminding people uh, uh, that there was a life uh, of the senses and there was a, that you could have also something to, I think maybe that was very, very important, uh, the importance of reason and rationality. Uh, and, and science. Well, what it all was about was about the abuse of authoritarian power. And that, that's something we have to be awfully careful about. Is people shouldn't, I think, associate just uh, the sources of authoritarianism with belief systems or with churches or whatever. Remember, we have, I claim that we would suggest that we are coming out of a dreadful authoritarianism in terms of the economic model through which we've lived. And maybe the most, where what I am reading uh, when, I, when I have opportunities now, I'm very much reading about how, uh, that you've heard me already saying how it has saturated uh, the society. But the other side of it was, just imagine, you say 55 and 60, 1958 to 1963 is the first program for economic expansion. Then you have the second program after that. Now, that accepts the concept of planning and the role of the state. Well, we're after 40 years of attack on the role of the state. The notion that the state's influence should be minimum. You've had people suggesting the privatization of public assets. You uh, have, in addition to that, the financialization of a global economy and so on. So you might, if you take it, I think it's in 1938, Walter, you get the Walter Lippmann seminar that suggests that 
you, neoliberalism as a concept is born. Then in 1947, you have the Pellerin Society, which is there to make the case that will Friedrich von Hayek, and it will go on through Milton Friedman and others, and people will differ with them because it isn't a single universe of opinion. But the idea is, is that the state is important. And that has turned into, in many parts of the world now, into an attack on democracy itself. And what it has done is that it has left people with no connection to legitimating sources of the state and whatever. You, therefore, you might, uh, th that is where the present debate is. The debate is, is that how can you uh, reconnect what you have argued by my, my, my speeches, how can you reconnect the European street to respected sources of trust and authority? These are really the issues. These are the issues that have to be debated in relation to the, to, the, to, 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 to the future of Europe. Because if you don't, and you leave people disconnected, alienated, uh, the rest of it is, there will be those who will come with loud voices from the shadows, Morris, saying, I want to speak for you. And what they speak might be a very old language of xenophobia and hatred and anti-migrant feeling and so on. We've spoken a lot about your contemporaries. All of the, all of the debaters we've mentioned are men, male students. And this hist, of course, is the worst offender of all. It, it was very late. Yeah. It was very late. Trinity tended to be late as well over NUI yeah. on admitting women as students, admitting women as, as students. But in terms of in, 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 why do you think women took so long and were kept out for so long out of the frontier of debating in all, in all the universities, but perhaps particularly in this university? In when, this, I, when, this when I was society. auditor, I tell you most in, 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 an interesting thing. We, Maura Allen was debating with us in, uh, in, 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 in UCG, and we were invited to Minut. And we went to Menut with a woman in the team. And the head of the college was in Rome. And there was an assistant who felt he couldn't take the decision to allow her to speak. So she was kept a separate in a room. And we were brought off to whatever light food we were being offered or whatever. And we didn't see her again until just before the debate itself. And <laughs> she came out to speak, and there was a thunderous applause for her arrival and so on. And she was the first woman to speak in a debate in 1964 in, uh, in, in Menuth College. Later on then, uh, when you had that period of liberation theology and the final year students were, were invited, to, they were allowed to vote on who they wanted to come and talk to them in the final year before ordination. And I finished very near the top of that list. <laughs> and uh, I was told that that could not be permitted. So they had built new residences at the time, the Divine Word and Dranat, please from that. So I went down and I spoke at, uh, in the evening and the residences would not in the hall. But I had been back many times since. A wonderful debate, this is what I'll tell you, which was, it was one, I think it was on the first divorce referendum. And the professor of moral theology and myself were on the stage. And he said, we were discussing, you know, that incredible language, when I think what we went through about it all, about the first woman and the second woman. You know, he'd gone off and married a young one, as they would say, and all this, God, what about the first wife? And we were asked about retirement, and he said, as long as I have some little nun to boil an egg for me in the morning, <laughs> that's all I will want. <laughs> Whereupon at that stage, the Sisters for Justice, who were into liberation theology, they had taken their own name, John the 23rd and so on, and a solid phalanx of them stands up, and it, the rule as we would say, lasts for about 10 minutes. 
So <laughs> that was the you you you're right about it. But you know what it is, what it, what we need to be careful about is that not to I I understand uh, these how people held different views and. Uh, there are new forms of authoritarianism in our present culture, and new forms of aggression, and new forms of intolerance, and new forms of censorship, as and well. new forms and of political censorship. correctness, and and a yeah, very yeah. very much as well new for, I think very much a confusion of efficiency with effectiveness, the notion that you must be speaking like a robot to someone to to appear efficient. This we need. I think, to put empathy back into the center of the culture. Even if you can't have a, uh, you know, a, 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 that's what I think. What's your view, for instance, of the issue of censorship and free speech now and political correctness and the fact that, that people as distinguished and as free thinking and independent minded as Germaine Greer are sometimes not accepted in some university debating societies. I think that I was thinking about Wendy Brown's book, there's a discussion in it about the master baker in Colorado who uh, refused to, to bake uh, a wedding cake for a gay couple. It's ha happened nearer than Colorado. Yes, but yeah. I like the Colorado case because there's been quite a good piece written on it. And there's a lovely distinction in it where he says that his artistry couldn't be used for this purpose and so on. But in the end, uh, what the, the, the judgment, including this just Thomas and others, is about the significance of the cake. It was the cake that was important as the symbol of a wedding. So in other words, when you go in and you see a cake, you see there must be a wedding. So then the issue is as to whether, so on. But I, I, why I mentioned that case was, is that I think it's a complete abuse of personal freedom to be able to say that you use a, an extreme version of, of this uh, to defeat a, a democratic principle, a, a principle of rights and so on. Uh, I, I want to finish with a question, um, President. You spoke at Declan Kyber's inaugural 1972 uh, at the HIST, and the argument was that the modern university needed to be saved from technicians. It needed to be a truly humanist institution. Now, you've, um, you've touched on some of that. The Irish Times, by the way, noted that one of the best speeches was by a young Michael D. Higgins. But they, they, but they added, they added, without naming any culprits, that the debate went on too long to the point, <laughs> to the point of being boring. Yeah. Well, there are but, some people. There are always those who are bored easily. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, 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 they lack, you know, the the, the long comprehension that's needed, but. I do remember it well. Uh, Declan was, uh, in fact, I, 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 I had been ill and Declan came to see me to ask would I speak. And the previous visitor I'd had was Conor Cruz O'Brien because Conor's The States of Ireland is published in that year. And I'm there uh, in my bed and Conor has given me the book. <laughs> and this, when, it, when it, Kyber then came, and he said, you have that, what do you think? I said, he doesn't recognize the existence of the, the economic and the social. It's co too constitutional, too political. And of course, Connor is a very fine writer. And we later, would, we, we, we later had many, many different debates. I think that maybe the, the most, the clearest uh, respect for difference is in the chapter on the book on censorship, where I have argued that you shouldn't use the law in relation to public order to achieve a censorship purpose. And he argues in many cases where the stability of the society is at stake and the democratic frame itself is a reference. And he has another chapter there. And that's really what we have to get to. There's just no point in people uh, denigrating each other or, or abusing each other 
we, I have said, I, I always, I regard it as at this stage of my life, as I've been very privileged to have had the opportunity of, of being to university against all the odds and of being a university teacher and of being out in the public and had people give me the gift of listening to what I had to say. And that's terribly important. And we, something we, we, we must respect. That therefore, when I have a different opinion with somebody on, on, let us say, on economics or the connection between economy and society and rights or whatever, you, you have to respect the position from which people come. This is where debating is so important, is that you look, the assumptions are laid on the table. They're either weak or strong. And then when you, in fact, see that the assumptions are weaker and are capable of sustaining an argument, you change course. And that's really what policy is about. And that's what publics need to sustain democracy. And that is why it is always wrong to replace that discourse with technos. You to say, for example, that very few people will understand the complexity of this issue. Maybe it might be in relation to international credit or in relation, in, in, in relation to capital. And we are at the moment living through a new form of debt capital, which is inflating the value of shares and companies in the, United, in the west coast of the United States, which creates a great fragility in relation to shareholders and investors. You also have a very slow return in relation to pension funds. So you have to think anew. That's why I very much now, uh, I'm speaking somewhere, I think, in relation, how do you take the locked up funds in fossil, in this fossil fuels and others? And you could offer to those who are seeking a return on their investment, you could offer them a return, you could offer pension funds a return by enabling a transition to green economics. But you sh can't deal with green issues without dealing with inequality issues. So the big challenge facing us internationally and globally is a something like the challenge of a paradigm shift of the same significance as the Keynesian one in its day, although the circumstances are very different. But if you want to discuss that, you have to respect opinions, and you have to win the argument. And winning the argument, great preparation for that, is in fact participating in debating. And universities would in fact lose a very, very great deal if they ever lost the opportunity to debate and to reason. And, uh, and oh, many, 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 all of us, many of us who were in an apprenticeship for the public world gained from that experience. I think that's a very um, good point at which to... Uh, a, a very good point at which to conclude our conversation, and I invite you now to declare open this week to mark the 250th anniversary of the HIST. May I congratulate the HIST, and may I congratulate all of those who are in any way in involved in organizing what is a celebration of something wonderful, the right to debate, the importance of debating, and I formally declare this week of celebration open. Bye -bye. Ladies and gentlemen of the Comic Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a splendid evening and we are incredibly indebted to our president for a splendid conversation with uh, John Cole. And of course, this has all come at the end of a couple of days when 
two debaters from not just North America and Britain and Ireland, but I think we forgot to mention France. France is here too. spreading the idea of the case, as we understand it here in these islands and indeed in North America, spreading it into France has become incredibly enjoyable and important. Uh, so we are delighted that France is in the world. President, Provost, Auditor, President of the Society, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, it's, I think, 48 years since I first found myself at an event uh, in this public theatre, in this exam hall. It was the inaugural uh, for Declan Kybert's session. The subject that was under debate that night was the future of university in Ireland, with particular reference to the role of the students' union. And one of the speakers that night, as John Bowman reminded us, was our president, Michael D. Higgins. Um, and to be back 48 years later, finding the topic of the role of the university under debate uh, is really quite special. Um, can I say that the speakers in the debate tonight uh, gave us a very enjoyable evening but they gave us a very difficult evening indeed. Um, trying to pick a winner, a team winner, and an individual winner was really difficult. There were four teams, and I won't be letting any secrets out if I say that when we first discussed the merits, each of those four teams had its supporters as a potential winner. Um, and then when we came to discuss the question of an individual winner, again, so many of the candidates had supporters, the individual competitors and members of the team that, uh, the teams that weren't going to emerge as the team winner. So you presented us with a very difficult evening indeed. Um, it was an engaging debate. We had some very different styles on view, um, but we found it a fascinating exercise. Um, we had to come up with winners um, and we've done so. I suppose I'll maybe let the cat out of the bag a little bit um, by saying that it seemed to us that the opposition perhaps had the easier side of, of the argument. Um, but that is it, be that as it may. Um, the uh, winner of the prize for the best opposition speaker, uh, we have decided should go, uh, that the winner should be uh, Benjamin Hofner Brodsky from Harvard. And the winner of the team prize, 
And I wasn't being platitudinous when I said that each of the four teams had their supporters and each of the four teams was seriously considered. But the winner uh, was from UCD, Ellen H., Shane Sweeney and Cora Keegan. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society and ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all so much for coming to this opening event of the HIST 250 week. Um, we're delighted to have such an absolutely excellent evening with, with President Higgins and um, John Bowman um, just to, to launch this, this excellent celebration. Um, I'd like to invite all of the competitors from the inter-debate to come up and, and the judges to remain here. And um, we'll do a group photo once the event is concluded. And I'd like to invite all other attendees to the event across to the HIST conversation room, which is on the first floor of the GMB um, for a, a small wine reception. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody again for an excellent evening and an excellent start. Oh, yes, yeah. Sorry? Sorry. Anyway, but thank you very much for an excellent evening. Yeah. <laughs> Never then, a foggy son, the Uchtron Heron, Nihal Dio Higgin.